Like, you know, if he's asking eight million or something and somebody says, you know, I'll give you seven to he's like, you know, like fuck you. off, seven to nine, hangs the phone, you know what I mean? And what I realized was the aircraft business is like the good old boy club. It's really ripe. Your your grandfather has the airplane, you know, has an airplane license. And the folks that buy planes, they're just like, yeah, just, just call Jimmy. He'll get you a new plane, you know. We're talking about guys spending, you know, $20, $30 million. Oh, well, that's good. We just yeah. sold that $900,000 car no, you're just talking about. It. God damn, damn son. <laughs> Lunch on you. We talked about it. Congratulations. It's a nice one, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, you should be. <laughs> nice work. Welcome back to the podcast. Today we have an amazing guest on our show. We're super excited. And as you can see from the background, I mean, we got the entire lineup of luxury auto cars here for you guys today. Quick little thing on the side. Make sure to subscribe, follow us on all the different podcast channels, Apple Podcast, everywhere. You know where to find us, YouTube. Make sure to follow. So today's guest has worked as a general manager for companies like Ferrari, Maserati, Bentley, Rolls-Royce, and Lamborghini. He opened up top luxury auto dealership in 2015 here in Scottsdale, Arizona. Without further ado, welcome to the show, founder and CEO of Luxury Auto Collection, John Schlitt. Hey, 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 hey. hey. <laughs> quite the accolades there. I like that. Yeah, that's what you deserve, my friend. I so. guess so. So thanks for being here today. We're super excited to have you on our show. I mean, we as friends, regular customers, we've known you for quite some time now. We appreciate the relationship that we've built, um, had some fun along the way too. And uh, for those who don't know you, maybe give a little introduction and, and a background on where you started, how you started, and how you became the top luxury auto dealer in the state of Arizona. Golly, that's such a long... <laughs> well, I guess we got some time. We got time. <laughs> so... By the way. I started my car career in Dallas, Texas. I decided I was going to get in the car business after I'd gotten gotten out of uh, the bar business, um, managing some restaurants and some um, just local bars called the 19th Hole. One of my investors out there had some of those going and he moved to South Padre Island in Texas. And I said, well, I guess I'm going to, I want to try the car business. Some, everybody told me, Oh, you'd be great in sales. Da, 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 da. I said, okay, let's, let's try that. So I got in the car business in Dallas and golly, I don't 22 years ago. So whatever that is, 2021 or 2001, 2001 and worked for a small independent car dealership called Bentry Sports and Imports. Um, it was owned by a Persian gentleman, um, Ali Ranjbarian. And it, over there in that neck of the woods, he's, uh, you know, he used to be pretty legendary. He was um, a good car guy, tough guy to work for. But it was the crash, it was a crash course of the car business. Just learn the car business from A to Z, um, I mean, when I say A to Z, I mean being the controller, the accountant, buying cars, appraising cars, putting cars online, marketing cars, then selling the cars, then doing the finance for clients on cars. Just, was that just like all kinds of cars or was it already luxury? It was pretty luxury. It wasn't near as luxury as this, um, but he was always in... Um, the higher end segment, BMW, Mercedes, Porsche, you know, we'd have a Ferrari, a Lamborghini here and there. Um, <clears throat> worked, uh, ran that, started there just obviously selling. And after a year or so, just got more and more responsibility, kind of let me start buying. I brought in um, a couple of my friends um, there um, that have gone on to be some really top guys in the industry actually 
Chad Morgan, he's the general manager for Scottsdale Ferrari now. After I resigned, he became the general manager. Another friend of mine, Jeremy Williams, he owns his own, actually buy here, pay here, two two dealerships out in Texas. But um, we all kind of learned together there. And I was buying a lot of inventory out of Scottsdale. Um, the general manager at the time for Scottsdale Ferrari was um, a gentleman named Jerry Bird, and um, they just weren't they weren't keeping the trades here in Scottsdale. They were getting great trades, but Penske Automotive, I don't know at the time if they weren't really set up to keep all the trade ins and whatnot. But so they would you know sell a Ferrari trade for a you know 911 Turbo, and he would always call me and I would give him the offer, and virtually I'd, I I mean I probably got ninety percent of you know all their trade-ins um and that went on for about a year and a half and um i at that time they did a budget review with roger penske and they saw that this vendor in texas was buying you know i don't even know at the time well you know 10 15 million dollars worth of cars from them and they were like who is this who's this dealership they're like oh it's this guy john he's Good car guy, gives us, you know, gives us fair money on the trades. His checks are always good. You know, we haven't had any issues. And I guess the story goes that Roger was like, what the hell are you doing? Go hire that fucking guy, you know. Why do we not have him working here? So they brought me out in 2004, into 2004, to interview for – the used car manager position for Scottsdale Ferrari. And um, I I got the job, and they made me an offer. And it just so happened I was just about to get um, married for the first time, and I was way too young, but either way. So I had to kind of postpone, like, five months. I was like, well, I can't start till like, in May. Get married and got a honey, you know, honeymoon. So started Scottsdale Ferrari – um, May 2005, and um, I still remember when I came there in May, they were about seven or eight hundred thousand dollars in the negative for the year, um, net income. And by the end of 2005, the store ended up making like million, million six, and so it was about a two million dollar turnaround. And I was the youngest used car manager in all of Penske Automotive, and at the time they had 250 dealerships worldwide. And it was pretty big, pretty big accomplishment. Put us on the map pretty quick. So, got a got a big award from Penske that year, and you know, um, after that, they just about a year later, two years later, I took over. As used car manager at that time, um, Bentley and Rolls, Aston Martin, Jaguar, Land Rover, um, and did that for a couple years. Obviously moved the needle quite a bit for them. And then 2008 hit, you know, with uh, the economy and whatnot, and they let the general manager go for Scottsdale Ferrari Maserati and Aston and then promoted me to general manager and um, so we became general manager 2008 and at that time I was shit I was uh, what was I 27 years old um, so I was the youngest general manager in the history of Penske Automotive and um, we we just we did some big things down there we were at that time. We were on McDowell Road. Now, if anybody's you know is familiar with Scottsdale, I don't know who I was listening, but um, that was when we were on McDowell. Um, after at that point, I also ended up with Bentley and Rolls because they were next door. Then we moved uh, Scottsdale Ferry up to North Scottsdale. I forget, uh, maybe 2012. Um, in the meantime, we picked up. Lotus, I opened the Lotus store for him while also taking care of all the other stores. And then we had Fisker and opened that store, staffed, you know, 
staffed it with sales service, et cetera. Um, and moved up north, had Ferrari, Maserati, Bentley Rolls, Aston Lamborghini, I don't know, what, four store tops, you know, 260 employees and a great, great company, great company to work for. I just, uh, just, you know, corporate, uh, the corporate, the corporate thing, you know, there's only, there's only so much. There's only so much they're gonna pay. Yeah, there's you. always a lid on it. Yeah. There's a like, lid, baby. Like if you want to go a, to the sky, you gotta. There's do a your lid. Own. If you want to, if you want to go, you know, you gotta, you gotta do it for yourself. So I just kept, kept planning to do it for myself, but obviously it takes a lot of money in the in the segment that I'm in. So, um, you know, started, started. Uh, I still do remember one thing though. The area vice president of Pensacola Automotive told me, and it was literally the thing that made me say, fuck it, I'm done. He goes, he said to me, yeah, it's real easy to do with somebody else's money. When we were, t- like, had a meeting about how good the numbers were and everything. Yeah. He's like, yeah, John, it's real easy when you're using somebody else's money. And, man, it stuck with me so much. It still sticks with me. It still drives me crazy. Like, no belt. It's not about the fucking money. Yeah. The money's part of it, but that you know. Yeah, I mean yeah. they made all the money. Right? Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> yeah, really my percentage was yeah. nothing. Like, what are you talking about? You, you know, um, so found uh, found a way to you know start my own place. I resigned January first, two thousand fifteen. Um, started luxury auto collection, and shoot, started with you know two million dollars worth of inventory and. You know, now we're, you know, $30, $40 million in inventory. So eight years, a couple locations, you know, but, uh, yeah, it's been great. We've been, I've been very fortunate. Yeah, I mean, absolutely amazing story, obviously, right? Like, I mean, you know us, we kind of have to think, you know, at some point, like, you got to do your own thing if you want to kind of blow up. Uh, one thing that you just said that, that I want to get back to, like, you know, so they brought you on. They were basically in the in the hole, right? You kind of turned the whole business around. Uh, which in a corporate setting is even more difficult, right? Because they somewhat limit you, you know. Of course. Um, so what do you think you did different than, you know, what they did before you came in? And how did you turn it around? Like, you know, what was, what was your difference? What difference? You know, the difference was, for whatever reason, when I came here to Arizona, they, their mentality, still like the corporate, the corporate world really hadn't um, given the internet really any like respect per se. So when I say that, I mean, they were still doing like one lat one liner ads in the fucking Sunday paper, (laughs) you know, like probably 60% of the dealerships, they weren't even on auto trader. They weren't even on like cars.com. And back in 2000, 2005, eBay was a really, really big thing. Like we were selling, Lots of cars on eBay. I mean, probably 50% of our sales were coming from eBay. And nobody here, um, nobody was on eBay. So, really, the difference was switching the mentality of, hey, we're going we're gonna to present the cars right, right? It's almost like the three Ps. We're going we're gonna to present the cars right, we're going to have the right people, and we're going to price them right. And win, lose, or draw, doesn't matter what we own the car for, you know, we're going to sell it for what it's worth. And that's really what it is. It's like you don't win on everything, but they're still only worth X. Right. So you just sell them, price them, move them. But a lot of it was mainly just getting them um, restructured um, for their advertising. And, and a lot of another big part was just being a little more aggressive with the trades. They were in just everybody, not just them, but everybody was so timid to, you know, give somebody what their trades worth. It's like, you know, in our, in our business, it's like, you know, stealing the trade, but it's like, you just can't, you can't do that. I mean, you know, obviously you want to get the trade at a right price. You got to make money. Right. But at the same time, you still guys trade one time. You never see the guy again. It's like, you know, it's got to be fair. Right. 
mean, but but back then, with people not really being as savvy to the internet as they are by clearly now. I mean, you can, everybody's a professional, you know, with every, they've got everything at their fingertips. So, um, but back then that was a big, that was definitely a big part of it. What would you say right now with, um, with LAC, where are you volume wise as far as like how many, how many cars do you guys um, trade per month and what are typically, you know, the months that are like the strongest for you? Um, we, the Scottsdale, the Scottsdale location, we average right about a hundred cars a month. I mean, month in, month out. I mean, we have 190 cars in stock. So we're selling, you know, 50% of our inventory every month. But you, when you're selling a hundred, it's just constant. You know, maybe you're trading for 40, 50 cars. So I'm constantly buying all over the country. Right, and it's probably the same. I mean, of course, in, in real estate, like you know, you always have some home runs, you have some losers. You know, you just gotta like you gotta keep swinging, right? That's what we just talked about the other day. If you, a lot of people don't just pull the trigger on stuff and then they just sit and then you don't make money. Like you gotta keep going, going, going. That's how you get exactly. the big wins and that's how you make money, right? Like it's it's all in the turnover at some point. It's all in the turn. I mean, we 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 probably lose money on twenty percent of the cars we sell every month. I mean, not huge numbers, but yeah, some are huge. Bit. Yeah. Or some are small or whatever, but like I said, it goes back to just selling cars for, you know, what they're worth. It doesn't, if you own it for X, that doesn't mean it's going to sell for X more, you know. And at the same time, if you got a really good buy on something, it doesn't mean you need to cheap sell it neither. Right. You know, you just sell it for what it's worth. Is it generally, is there a difference between the price point? Like, do you make... Do you prefer deals that are, like, higher price when we just talked about the car that's here? It's about 900000 It's right behind the camera. Like, are those deals usually better in the car market, or is it your kind of bread and butter, hundred fifty grand, you know, like like entry-level luxury car type thing? Because that's, just, you know, again, we're trying to relate to real estate, right, where it's like we, we like the luxury stuff because it, there's more margin on it. There's uh, They don't move as fast, but... Yeah, yeah, for us, our average selling price, it runs right around 120000 130000 Um when everything washes out and I like to have something for, you know, not for everybody, but for the segment that we're in, you know, 75,000 to, you know, a million dollars per se. Um, in, in that price point, obviously your clients are in a different tax bracket and they're not quite as, um, susceptible to, you know, Every day, you know, staring at the stock market, oh, it's down, you know, 500 points or 500, five, you know what I mean? Yeah. They can, you know, so this inventory, it it, uh, it definitely holds its value a little better. Um, I mean, obviously, it, it depreciates, you know, I mean, depending, I mean, for the last few years, it's been, you know, it's been crazy, but um, it's, it's just also the, the sig you know, it's like you guys. You guys are in high end, you know, homes. You know what I mean? It's a you don't buy it. Yeah, it's a whole different buyer. It's a whole different mentality. It's it's the people that we know and our clients that are, you know, repeat and referrals and so yeah. I wanna to touch on something that you and I talked about a few weeks back when we <laughs> He's itching, he's itching. <laughs> when we were golfing. <laughs> okay, okay. I think it's two things. One, um I know that you started um dealing with private jets now a little while ago. I think it would be interesting to kind of see how that how that started and how, how that is going because that is something that um I personally find super interesting because there's a there's a remodel component, there's a there's a lot of things that are interesting, so maybe tell us a little bit about that and we want to know what's the craziest deal that you've done to date, <laughs> <laughs> obviously without mentioning any names. Um, so I got in the aircraft business, um, I think in 2018, 18 or 19. Um, and at that time, uh, one of my clients, um, he, he was a big airplane guy and virtually he never saw a deal he didn't like. But he had all the money in the world, so he would he would buy a bunch of you know he would have three or four airplanes at a time. But he was he was 
75, 77 years old, and he he wasn't really good at selling them. You know, he could buy them all, but he wasn't that good at selling them. And he just was a little rough with people, you know, like, <laughs> like you know, if he's asking eight million or something, and somebody says, you know, I'll give you seven two, he's like, you know, like you. fuck off seven nine, hangs a phone, you know what I mean? There's probably somewhere in between, you know, there might be a, you know, yeah, there might be a landing spot there, but it's just he was so <laughs> brutal. So, I, I I told him I said, hey, let if I educate myself, figure out, you know, as I go. You know, will you let me, will you let me, you know, try to sell these? And he said, yeah. He said, I'm going to tell you how much I want anything over that you can keep. I said, okay, fair enough. I'll pay for all the marketing. I'll do everything. And what I realized was the aircraft business is like the good old boy club. So it's like, it's, it's really ripe. I mean, it's, it's, when I say the good old boy club, it's like, your your grandfather has the airplane, you know, has an airplane license, and the folks that buy planes, they're just like, yeah, just just call Jimmy, he'll get you a new plane. You know, we're talking about guys spending, you know, twenty thirty million dollars, you know. So it there was really once again, it's almost like the car game. Nobody was nobody was big on their marketing. Nobody was big on the pictures. Nobody was big on the email blast and all the all the different aircraft sites that you can be on. It once again went back to it just everybody had it so everybody has it so good they just don't even go the extra mile to to get the aircrafts out there. So obviously learn uh, it, the aircraft is a whole different ball game of knowledge with service and inspections and oh that's good we just yeah. sold that nine hundred thousand dollar car know, you're just talking about god damn, damn son lunch on you we talked about it congratulations that's a nice one sir yes sir <laughs> yeah you should be <laughs> nice work um so what were we talking about airplanes airplanes yeah so just so much goes into them it, it's not something you can just dive in very niche yeah niche so about two years ago i got um my own line of credit um for aircraft so now it's a whole different ball game now i've got a full team we've got i've got two two um full-time maintenance directors um one sales guy and another guy who helps the sales guy acquire airplanes and it's um we buy all all over the world i mean i've got you know Planes coming from, you know, Germany. Just bought a Challenger 604 from Australia. Um, just really all over. So what's the refurbishing or the remodel component? So you told me about that. Some, some of them, um, some planes, you know, might just need to have ins an inspection done or, you know, but when I say inspection, so planes are like uh, every 12 months, 24 months, 36 months, 60 months, 96 months. Um, and then 12 years. So the little one year, two year stuff, that's fairly inexpensive in, in the price, you know what right. I mean? Proportion, 10, 20 yeah. grand, 30, you know? Um, but then you start getting into the 60 month and the 96 month, 144 month, that stuff, you know, some of those can get up, you know, six, $700,000 for an inspection. So a lot of people and the planes down for three, four months. So a lot of people get to that point and they're like, oh, fuck. I'm just going to buy another plane, you know, let the next guy deal with this, you know. So sometimes those are the buys. Um, but what you're talking about is also like doing interior, paint interior. So a lot of times I like to, you know, find a plane that has, you know, great service. Everything's got to have great service history, you know, period. I mean, um, but good service history, but paints, no, you know, paints old, interiors four or five years old. We'll take them in send them to our paint shop, have, you know, do some fun wild paint schemes, um, send, you know, do, do brand new interiors, you know, you know, make them nice. So even though the guy's buying a 15 year old plane, the day he steps in it, it feels like it's two days old. Right. And, 
you know, people spending that kind of money, that's really what they expect. I, I've noticed we've tried to, we've had airplanes that we bought that are beautiful airplanes, nothing, you know, absolutely ready to go, but maybe the interior is like two years old or something, still looks nice. Right. By by all means, you would not want to fly in it. But you know what I mean? They want to look new. Yeah, they, yeah. everybody wants it to be like brand new. What's know? the What's the biggest deal you've done? Like a single transaction deal in your career? <sighs> On cars or planes? Either one. Um, or give us the car and the plane. Okay, so I bought two Bugattis from a very well-known boxer. <laughs> Um, yeah, he's, uh, he's, he's undefeated. We'll leave it at that. And, um, he, we, I was getting shopped these cars from a broker and it's like, I know whose cars these are, you know, the orange one, it was a black and orange and a white on white. And I said, I know whose cars these are like, I'm not going to deal with this broker because the guy wanted me to wire him the money. Then he was going to wire the owner the money. And if we're talking, you know, it was like five million bucks or something. You know, it was a lot of money. Right. Like, I'm not doing that. This guy, who knows? So I I actually had my uh, my buddy R.D. He called he called up Jamie Foxx. And Jamie was like, he was like, yo. I'll get a hold of him. Yeah, call a guy. You know what I mean? We're the fucking buyers. We've got the money. You know, and it was like two days before New Year's Eve, too. It was crazy. And um, so Jamie got a hold of him. He called, you know, and dealing with him is always an experience. You know, he's he's the best. Um, we figured it out, you know, and he's like, you know, we're like, all right, well, we're just, you know, we'll wire the money today. Just send us copies of the title or whatever, and we're going to fly over there and pick them up tonight. So we wire him the money, fly over there. Truck shows up. Of course, he's, you know, two hours late. He's on his time, you know. Yeah. It's raining. It's like the night before New Year's Eve. I'm like, oh, my God. My wife's like, I mean, really? Like, you got to go right now? I'm like, yeah, babe, I'm going. Like, I'm making sure these things are on the truck. Like, I'm not doing the celebrity time shit. You know what I mean? We're getting them today. Um, it's happening. Yeah, it's happening. So, yeah, his, his, his son was like 15, gotten a rear-ended somebody in one of his Mercedes, so he had to go talk with the cops, kind of smooth that over, so he's running a little late. Yeah. yeah. So that was – that's probably one of the funnest acquisitions. Um, but we sell – you know, we've sold lots of, you know, million, two million dollar cars. Just 900,000. Yeah, 900,000 while we're sitting here. That's not too bad. That's not a bad day in the office. No. It literally showed up yesterday. What car? I mean, everybody probably wants to know what car this is. Just it's a the, quick info on it. It's the Lamborghini Ultimate uh, Roadster, and they made 250 of them worldwide. And that that particular one right there has, I think, 196 miles or something. That's almost brand it's, new. Yeah, it's it's yeah, they're, they're non-existent. There might be three of them in the country for sale, and we're like we usually are about. You know, fifty, sixty thousand less than everybody else. In percentage wise, we're talking five, six percent, but still. Yeah, because we talk a turnover. You want to move them. That's right? it. You're not making money that's, if they sit here. That's right. it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know. What's your personal favorite car? I mean, you see, like, I mean, you can take whatever you want, right? But give us like your top, top two or three cars. We know what you drive daily. Yeah, that's <laughs> the best. Yeah, <laughs> I think my favorite car to drive is the Rolls, the Cullinan. I mean, clearly right now, it's just... All-time favorite? Yeah. Yeah, it's my... All- for a luxury car. Yeah. For a luxury car, for sure. Before that, though, it was the it was the Wraith, the two-door coupe. I mean, that car is so nice, so comfortable. I mean, obviously, Rolls, I mean, you would expect that, but it's really it's that nice. I'll tell you what, though, a sleeper for a daily driver... The Mercedes, the new, the Maybach is incredible. It is incredible. For $200,000, which is a lot of money, but still, the drive, the experience, all the modes in that car, and it's funny because you'd think you wouldn't want to even, even drive a Maybach. You just want to ride in the back, but driving it 
changed crap. a little bit. Same with the Rolls Royce, right? Like I feel like years ago it was more like you had a driver. And when it was that big ass out. van of, uh, I mean, you couldn't even get in the grocery store in that thing. Yeah. I mean, was it the up. Phantom or something? Yeah, the one? Phantom. I mean, yeah. that thing is so big and long, and I mean, they still make that car, and it's incredible. It's it's tough to drive it on a daily basis. As far as exotic, what's your favorite exotic car? My favorite would be, it's for sure a Ferrari. I just don't know if it would be um, the 488 or F8. Or, man, I'd really enjoy driving the V12s, like the 812 or the F12. Yeah. But definitely Ferrari, hands down. For me, it's Ferrari. I mean, I spent 10 years with Ferrari and probably three years with Lamborghini, and I love Lamborghini. I think they're incredible, incredible, you know, great-looking cars. I just, um, I think the fit and finish on the Ferrari is hands down. Yeah. Yeah. So the last two years with COVID, oh, two or three years, have, have been a little crazy, right, on the real estate side as well as on the car side. So how has that been the last... I would say year for you. What do you think? Where where is the market headed? I'm just curious to see how that correlates a little bit with the luxury space that we in. Yeah, the whole like over sticker is that gonna is that gonna be for a while? Like we you know just look at the Range Rovers and stuff. You still yeah. see like crazy numbers on some of these cars. Like how long do you think it's gonna stay like this? Um, that's a great question. I wish I if I had that answer. You know, we would. Um, I mean, obviously, I've got a pretty good uh, finger on the pulse. But the premium market is is the problem is is still the manufacturers are not getting near as many cars as they used to deliver. Obviously, their supply chains are still jacked up. It's it slowed down so much during COVID that they really just it's going to take a little while to catch up. I think we still probably have another year um, before we see some the normal levels coming in of cars. So the premium, you know, a lot of like in this segment, you know, high end segment, when people want something, they want it, you know, I mean, I hate to say it, but you know, twenty, thirty thousand dollars, $30,000, like who gives a fuck? Yeah. I mean, really? It's like, do I want to wait a year and a half or do I want to, you know, spend an extra 30 grand and maybe lose 30 grand, but it's, it yeah. is what it is. Like they want it. So right. they're going to get it. Right. Um, COVID in general, um, obviously, you know, 20, you know, 2020 or 21, 2020, 21 was insane with the car market. Um, used cars is really, you know, there were no new coming in. Used cars were on absolute fire. Um, now that has somewhat trickled off. Um, but once again, the manufacturers in the, you know, European models are still so far behind. And then all the other dealers, you got to remember a lot of people do three-year leases on cars when they buy a new car, like a BMW, Audi, Mercedes. They'll do a three-year lease, and in three years they get a new one. So the car they have is always under warranty, right? Yeah. They drive it 30,000 miles, they turn it back in, here's the keys, adios, I want the, the new S-Class or whatever, they drive it three years. Some, a lot of people... You know, keep cars like that. In our world, it doesn't seem like they do, but they do. Mm. Um, but you got to remember, in 2020 and 2021, there was no cars to lease. And you're talking about, you know, an industry that's selling 17 million cars a year when you peel out 8 million cars and those dealers are used to getting those cars back every three years, lease returns, and then they sell those as used cars. So the used car market has really dried up on your, you know, I'd say twenty to $80,000 price range. It's really dried up. So what we've noticed here in the last, you know, three, four months is those cars are going back up, you know, probably six, seven, eight percent, which is crazy because we've watched everything kind of come down, level out, and then in the last... 90 days, everything's back up, you know, six, seven, eight percent. So we'll see. Do you, in the car market, do you see like a, a big correlation between like stock market, interest rates, like that kind of stuff, you know, exchange rates, or is that in the car market not as 
big of a deal or a factor as far as you know how much you sell, how much profit you make on the car? Like, does it affect it? It, it definitely it definitely affects the profit. It definitely affects the profit. Things have def- definitely tightened up. Um, obviously, grosses have compressed. You know, um, after COVID, you know, it's back to the real car business where you know you need to price things properly, aggressive. You know. Um, as far as the stock market, yeah, I mean, if you, you know, if the market drops, you know, four, five, six thousand points, we definitely, you definitely feel the phone go, you know, <laughs> stops ringing all of a sudden. You're like, well, what the hell's going on around there? Mm. You know, but then, you know, a couple of days later, so I, I don't know if, you know, the, the smaller drops really make a big difference. The interest rate, it's funny, be, the, you know, Obviously, interest rates are up, you know, four and a half percent in the last, you know, whatever, two year and a half, five percent. Um, but our finance ex- absorption is virtually the same. We, our clients finance about about forty percent of our clients finance, Got it. Um, and we've seen it stay the same, um, even with the rate being a little bit higher. Everybody realizes. Like it's just kind of the price you gotta pay right now. I mean, I remember my my parents told me like this is not the first house I bought. It was twenty three percent interest. Right. But of course, it was probably like forty thousand fucking dollars, yeah. you know, too. So. But I think it but is. But still, it is. Yeah. it it is what it is, and hopefully, I mean, obviously for everyone, hopefully, the, you know, the Fed slows down, and I, I I'm kind of hearing that hopefully we're getting to the top of that and maybe we'll start to see some reduction, you know, probably not in the next six months or anything, but yeah, that's know. kind of what we're hearing on the, on the, on the real estate side too. And then aspect. people will, you know, then it'll be another great frenzy for folks because people will be, you know, refinancing and, you know, making some different moves. I mean, you guys got to see it in the market. Like right now, it's like people want to sell their house, but then they go, well, I'm at three percent, three and a half percent. I don't really want to go to seven, or they say, "Yeah, I'm selling my house. I'm making X amount of dollars, but to go buy my house, I got to spend. Oh yeah, even more, more money. You know what and I mean? Then you pay more. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's probably nicer, but you know what I mean. You guys notice that? Uh, we we did. I think what it what happens too, like you just said though, I think everybody adjusts to the new normal, right? So mm-hmm. they probably. You know, we have those guys that a year ago, they're like, oh, I got a 275, I'll never sell, right? And now they're like, hey, look, I just found this house. Can we go look at it? I'm like, You know, what happened? Mm-hmm. Like, they still want to move on. They see something nicer, bigger, better. They make more money, you know, stuff changes. So I think a lot of people that are now saying like, oh, I'm never moving again. Uh, you know, I got the best interest rate. I think, you know, in the next two to five to seven years, I mean, they're going to forget, forget about it and just want something new, bigger, better, right? They just move on. And I think it's... You know, we always say if you can't control it, you just got to roll with it, right? Like, I mean, mm-hmm. so I think I think that's going to happen. I think we'll be fine. I think there's a little bit of a slowdown, but but people get over it in a way. And then you look at two other factors that I think are very relevant. Obviously, one is inventory, kind of similar to your high-end vehicles, right? Um, there's only so much inventory available. That's one. And the second thing is uh, most of the deals are cash, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, over over five million dollars in the luxury real estate segment. You know, they pay cash, so it doesn't really care too much about it's the just another asset why wouldn't they want yeah. to park it in real estate instead of parking it in the market that's so volatile yeah i mean i'm sure that's how they got to look at it. that's how i look at it when i buy my house or you know vacation house or whatnot you know it's like got a better shot here than parking it you know with uh you know your broker who's a genius and every time I, you know you get the statement you're down two percent instead of up ten percent like well, this is the one i was sold on <laughs> I got I got one one personal question, John. What do you <clears throat> what do you enjoy doing the most when it comes to your business, and and what's the main motivator for you to keep to keep going? I man, I really I love what I do. It's so much fun. You know, every car that you buy, it's almost like I get to gamble legally all day, every day, because. Every car you buy is a gamble, right? I mean, you make your money when you buy the car, not really when you sell it. I mean, because if you buy it right, you're always going to make money when you sell it. 
So it's like every day I get to make two, three, four, five hundred million, two million, three million dollar gambles. And then I get to wait for it to pay off. And then when it pays off, it's like, yeah, I was a winner. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's yeah, like I mean, somebody else appreciated that car like I would appreciate it because yeah. it's hot. You know what I mean? And, you know, it's like, so that I, um, I love what I do. And to keep going, I'm, you know, I've got a, you know, beautiful family. You know, I've got a five-year-old and eight-year-old daughter, a beautiful wife. I mean, you keep going because you never know what, you know, try to stack as much money away as possible. Obviously, you got to live. You never know what's going to happen. But I, you know, I, I didn't come with, you know, I, I, I didn't, like, grow up in poverty or anything. But, you know, we were middle to lower class. And, you know, my parents did great. I, I never really per se wanted for anything you know i probably wanted a bunch of stuff i didn't get but you know what i mean i i don't want to say like i came from you know some rough you know area or anything but i just want that you know what what everybody wants they want the absolute best for their kids you know they want them you know it's also always a little bit addicting right once you start doing a little bit better you're like damn that's nice and that's nice and then you're like you're like hmm yeah. I always did want that house from Max and <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, mm, but, uh, hold on a second, you know, it's like that, you know, you're like, Hmm, having these private planes is awfully nice. Maybe I need to own one of my own, <laughs> it's, but it's hard to own one when you got three, you know, you got two or well, three of them in yeah. stock. Like, it's like, it's kind of the best of both worlds. I mean, who doesn't want to sell exotic cars and sell private jets and have, I don't know, 180 exotic cars or nice, nice cars, and through you know, a couple, two, three jets in stock. Like, hello, like, Suck. where are we going? You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I mean what's it? So it's very, very been very fortunate that it's all worked out. And one other thing know. that that uh, you seem to enjoy that we enjoy is like we always see with different watches and stuff. Mm. Uh, is that like kind of a hobby? Do you like flip them? Is it like a little bit of a bit, a little bit of both? It's like you know, because, yeah, literally every time we see you, pretty much get a different watch on, and those are not like swatches and G Shocks, right? So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a little Casio. <laughs> I, uh, you know, it's one of those things where I do enjoy them very much, and I, I feel like it's the same type of thing. They're assets. You know, you can always cash them. I mean, I can't. You know, there's yeah. always somebody who write you a check. Um, I don't really. It's funny because my wife always says you're freaking nuts. You need to. You know, Come. sell something or trade one or do something, but it's like if you don't have to, it's hard to let them go because I like them. Yeah, you and know? like you said, they're like almost like cash in your safe, right? It, like exactly, you- it, they're assets. You know, you you can you know most of the time, quite frankly, they go up in value. You right. know, or they stay pretty level. <laughs> you know, it's probably the of all hobbies that's the that's the best one I've got. After golf, <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> All right, let's uh, you down for a little game. Oh God, sure. All right, Patrick and I will introduce you to this or that. You ready? Okay. Ferrari SF90 Stradale or Ferrari F8 Tributo. Mm, oh, so I say this or that? I say one of them. Do it one more time. Sorry, I, I didn't. I, SF90 Stradale or F8 Tributo? I mean, the SF90 is hands down. Okay. Lamborghini Huracan or Euros? Man, I would go with the Euros. Rolls Royce Wraith or Rolls Royce Dawn? I'm a Wraith guy. I don't. I'm not a big convertible guy. Bentley Continental or Bentley Flying Spur? Continental. McLaren 720S or 570S? Yeah, hands down 720. Porsche 911 or Porsche Panamera? Mm, probably the 911. Okay, and here's the last one. I pretty much went for every coupe when there was a four-door option. I don't know. <laughs> I, I just love the coupe. I don't know. Here's the last one. Maybach or Cullinan? Oh, fuck, man. If it's not money, you got to go with the Cullinan. Okay. I mean, you know, if you've got... <laughs> yeah, if if there's not a budget, you got to go calling it. Yeah. 
All right, one one uh, one last question that we always ask everybody to like, you know, knowing what you know now in life and business, if you would sit down with the younger John, thirteen year old, fifteen year old John, like what kind of advice would you give yourself, which you're probably gonna give your kids, but you know, what what was it that, you know, you learned throughout the last twenty, thirty years in your life that you wish you would have known early? You know, I I think the what I usually, t if anybody ever asked that is younger, it's like, how did you, you know, how did you get there? Or what did you do? I, I literally was on a, I think it all, it all falls back to like, uh, never, just never being outworked. So just hard work. Like nobody's going to give you anything. Everybody nowadays wants to be famous. Like, overnight everybody wants to be rich overnight it's like tenacity you know what i mean like just the fact of you're gonna if you are never outworked and you grind all the time and the relationships you build are so important the people that are around you are so important so if if i was to give any advice to anyone young that's or younger or trying to do this really anything is just grind just be there just be present work hard at it try to master your craft and don't give up and surround yourself with more sick people that are more successful than you are especially at the beginning because being around more successful people or you know what I mean people that are more successful when you're younger and you're trying to trying to make your move in life you get so much good advice from them and you see how they move around and you see what they do and you see the different, you know, if they're, you know, if they're, if you're, if they're letting you in, they kind of show you the deals they're doing. And I feel like all deals are the same. You know what I mean? Even though it's all different, it's like you guys with real estate and, you know, the first deal is the property, but it's like me. First deal is buying the car. You know, the second deal, you guys are building the house. The second deal. Is me getting it online and marketing it properly, you know, cultivating a customer. Same thing with you. You know what I mean? Negotiate. It, yeah. Negotiate. It's like relationships and and working hard. I mean, I've had this business eight years. We we you know, like I said, sell a hundred cars a month. People don't believe it. They're like, get out of here. I'm like, bro, just look at the board. Every I mean, I have like a board. I do it old fashioned. I have every single sales guy in every car we sell every month. Da -da -da -da. Um. But, you know, if and, I, and I'm here six days a week. You know, I might be in and out, but I still work, you know, Monday <laughs> Monday through Saturday, you know, and we're closed on Sunday. So, I mean, I'm still here grinding every single day with these guys because I love it and because it's my baby and because You're good at it. I want to make, yeah, good at it. I want to make sure everything goes smooth. All right, guys, uh, that's that's a wrap. That's uh, a wrap, baby. A wrap. Thank you so much, John, for your time. That was uh, that you. was absolutely amazing. And uh, like I said in the beginning, we we appreciate the the friendship and the partnership that we've built. For us, that's very special. We look up to you. You've built something really amazing, and uh, we're looking forward to many more deals, rounds of golf, good times, All and that. Uh, and thank you so much, man. Well, you guys know, man. I'm 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 big fans. You guys are incredible. You guys have done the same thing. It's awesome. It's good Thanks. to see other people that are hustling, honed in on their craft, working hard at it, and, you know, doing the damn thing. I love it. I love Thanks. you guys. You guys are great. More golf. More golf to go. More golf. <laughs> oh, you, you two got to take it easy on A couple me. You shots. Are, yeah. You guys are too good. <laughs> All right, perfect. So that wraps it up. Um, again, like we said in the beginning, make sure to like, subscribe, comment, share, do all the fun stuff. Um, this is going to be on all different platforms. Um, we'll post all the links below. We're going to post John's info and the website to his uh, business. We can buy some nice little cars over here. And um, we'll see you in the next one. Thank you. Thanks, guys. See you.